in behavior of palladium hydride. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, but it will include uh, that which I'm supposed to talk about. So there's a slight surprise if you're following the, uh, the schedule. <clears throat> People who uh, study cold fusion using electrolytic cells frequently use a catalyst in their cell to recombine the hydrogen and oxygen back to water. If you simply measure the temperature of that recombiner, you can obtain some very useful information. You can obtain the Let's go to the next. You can obtain the D to PD ratio of the cathode very simply. You can uh, calculate the enthalpy of formation if you use that information combined with the information from the calorimeter. And you can also identify errors that result because the recombiner that you're using doesn't function properly. And one of the things that I've discovered is that many of the recombiners that people rely on are not reliable. And therefore, you can get behaviors that challenge one's ability to uh, understand, and hopefully you don't attribute it to L, E, and R. Well, I'm going to, these measurements are based on an electrolyte using sulfuric acid in water. The results do not depend upon the nature of the electrolyte, but sulfuric acid turns out to be a very fine electrolyte for the, for the study of, of, of LNR if you care to use it. I'm using a Seebeck calorimeter, and we'll be studying three different kinds of palladium. A commercial uh, palladium, that's normal commercial uh, concentration of palladium, an arc melted super pure palladium. Both of those are in the form of a sheet, one millimeter thick, and a zone refined single crystal, which would be very, very pure. Uh, and, and somewhat unusual. Not too many people have access to that. But let's talk about the uh, calorimeter. The calorimeter uh, is shown in the open condition. It uh, consists of a <clears throat> aluminum box <clears throat> that's water-cooled on all sides. And on the inside is, is uh, pasted 54 thermoelectric converters, all hooked in series. Any heat that's generated in the box, it doesn't matter where it originates, will be detected by the calorimeter. So you don't have to worry about gradients with this particular style. The uh, design is uh, large enough so that you can put almost anything in there. Uh, I have put in uh, Geiger counters, for example. I, I've put in magnets. I have a cell that the magnets produce a magnetic field at the cathode of 2,000 Gauss. Uh, you can go higher than that with a smaller cell. I also have a cell that allows a sample to be exposed to gas, either deuterium or hydrogen, and heat it up to three, 300 degrees, all the while measuring any excess energy to plus or minus five milliwatts. So th this I, is a very fine calorimeter. It's, it's very, very stable, and I would highly recommend, if you're getting into this field, that you make one like this. And I, I will be happy to share the design details if anybody cares to. Already three laboratories uh, are in the process of duplicating. <clears throat> On the right, you see, whoops, wrong button. Got to be careful with this thing. On the right, you, let me do it this way. This way I won't mess it up again. Uh, this is a oil reservoir and a balance. Any gas that is generated in the uh, cell is communicated <coughs> to this oil and that's weighed, which re allows measurement of the orphaned oxygen generated by the loading and gives another method of determining the D to PD ratio that's independent of the value obtained from the recombiner. The cell <clears throat> consists of a Pyrex, Pyrex cell around which is wrapped uh, resistance wire that allows 
the temperature of the cell to be changed independent of applied electrolytic power. The cell contains 300 milliliters of uh, electrolyte, and it doesn't, the, the calorimeter doesn't care what the cell looks like. So you can have any shape or size you care to have, and, and you will get the correct answer. <clears throat> Inside the cell is an RTD to measure the temperature of the electrolyte. This is the anode, which is platinum. Inside is the cathode attached with a plastic um, a clamp that allows the cathode to be removed very quickly. And this is a reference electrode for measuring the open circuit voltage. The important part right here for, our, for the talk today is right here. This is the recombiner, which is a cloth of carbon uh, on which is deposited finely divided platinum. It's very effective in recombining the gases back to water. Inside this tube is an, another glass-covered RTD to measure the temperature. Any gas that's generated within this cell has to pass by the recombiner to go out and go to the oil uh, reservoir. The calibration is done by applying power to the uh, heater, but you can put power in in any form whatsoever. I've used uh, light bulbs. I've used electrolytic technique. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, the source of energy in the Seebeck is, that makes no difference. So in this particular case, the calibrator is done automatically by stepping up in value until uh, I reach the top, which is, produces a temperature of about 85 degrees. This is the highest I wish to go. And then it goes back down in between the points that were made going up. 90 minutes is required for the, cal the calorimeter to reach equilibrium. And so the first point and the last point, which superimpose here, were made about 36 hours apart. If we look at the residual, this is the difference between the point and the least squares line. You can see that the residual fluctuates in a very random way within a band of about 5 milliwatts over the entire range. It's also necessary to know the characteristics of the temperature of the recombiner. This is measured by uh, applying electrolytic power to a platinum cathode so that there is no loss of hydrogen. All the hydrogen and oxygen now has to be recombined and, and produce a suitable temperature at the recombiner. This shows a rather broad range of values. This is closer to the value that I'm actually using, which is this right here, 0.1 amp. And you can see in both cases, the relationship is very linear between the amount of gas that has to be recombined and the temperature that results. <clears throat> Two measurements are made that are important. One, of course, is the excess power based upon the calorimeter and its calibration and the other is the recombiner temperature. These two pieces of information are the only piece of information that are used for the purposes that I'm describing today. Now, right away, you can see that, uh, and I should point out, too, when I turn on the electrolytic power initially after the calorimeter has reached equilibrium, I'm also applying power to the heater that is equal to the power that will be applied by electrolysis. And so when I turn on the electrolytic power, I turn off the power that I'm applying to the heater so that the calorimeter remains in equilibrium. So I can t start taking data almost immediately without the calorimeter having to wait for the 90 minutes. But you can see immediately that there are three basic regions to the loading characteristics. And, and this basic shape is true of all materials. It only, the, the, only the details change. This is how palladium loads when you react it in any cell. So you notice that initially that the electrolytic power is constant. And notice that it's negative. 
And the reason it's negative is it requires more power to decompose the water than you get back when the hydrogen reacts with the palladium. And this is that difference. And so it's negative to start with, but you notice that it's constant. The recombiner temperature is also constant. That's saying that all of the hydrogen that's being made available is going into and reacting with the palladium. But at some point, that efficiency starts to fall off, and you can see that the result is that the measured power starts to rise towards zero, the recombiner temperature starts to rise, and at some point, the recombiner temperature reaches its maximum value and is constant. In this region, every single atom of hydrogen is, is rejected. Now, by the, by the palladium. It's, that's not quite true. Some go in and come back out. So there's no net reaction taking place. And since there's no net reaction, all of the gas that is being made by electrolysis is being recombined, and so that produces the maximum temperature of the recombiner, and it produces zero for the measured excess energy. If you make such a study, this is a very good indicator to any uh, pathological skeptic that, in fact, your calorimeter can, in fact, make accurate measurements. I mean, this is really a demonstration of the quality of the calorimeter. Now, I can use a, a, few, a few mathematical equations. I won't go into that right now. If you're interested in the math, you can see me later on. But to measure, to use the temperature of the recombiner, I only need to know the temperature of the recombiner initially when no hydrogen was being re recombined, and the temperature after all the hydrogen is being recombined, those, those two limits. That's all I need to know. And with that knowledge in this equation, I can calculate the fraction of hydrogen that is entering the palladium. And the result is shown here. This is the average um, D to PD ratio. And this, well, in this case, I'm using light hydrogen. Uh, it's cheaper, but it produces the same effect uh, as a function of time. And this is the fraction reacted with the palladium as a function of time based upon that equation. And you can see that the composition follows the, the line that would predict 100% reacted based upon the applied current. It follows that very closely, as we expected. And then it starts to deviate. And then finally, it re becomes constant at the maxim maximum composition that this particular sample can obtain. And the fraction, you can see here, 90, this is saying that roughly 90% reacts for, for quite a while. And then it starts dropping off. And finally, zero reacts uh, after it's fully reacted. I have three different independent methods for measuring this ratio. The temperature of the recombiner, that's we, which I just described. The orphaned oxygen technique relies on the fact that when hydrogen reacts with the sample, oxygen is uh, left behind, uh, so-called orphaned. And that oxygen pressure builds up is communicated to the reservoir. The oil is displaced. I weigh the oil. From that, I can calculate how much oxygen, how many moles of oxygen, how, and I can convert that to the number of moles of hydrogen, and thereby get, at, in real time, every minute, in fact, uh, values for, the, for that ratio. Finally, after the uh, sample has reached saturation, I can take it out. <clears throat> And within one minute, place it on a five-digit balance, watch the loss of hydrogen, extrapolate that back to zero time using the square root of time. And from that, I can gain a value for the weight based upon the weight. Each of these are independent of one another. And when agreement occurs, that's a pretty good indication that we are, in fact, measuring reality. It's interesting, though, that this does not always match, and there are uh, occasions when you get differences between the uh, different measurements. 
those reveal processes that are truly abnormal, and I, I don't have time to get them into them today, but it, what it, right, it says once again that every time you look at palladium, you see something weird. I mean, LNR is just one of those characteristics that we happen to be fond of, but there are other weird behaviors. Now, the enthalpy of formation <clears throat> can also be obtained from this because we know how much hydrogen is reacting, and we know the energy that that has uh, resulted in producing using the calorimeter. But before I show you my data, I'd like you to see what the literature shows. There are three measurements reported in the literature for the enthalpy of formation as a function of composition. Uh, and this is done by placing finely divided palladium in a calorimeter. They will load it and deload it 10 times in order to activate the surface so that it loads very quickly. And then they will apply a known pressure, and that will result in a characteristic composition. And in that process, energy is given off, and they measure that energy and report it as enthalpy of formation. And so you can see when the alpha, in the alpha phase, the, the enthalpy of formation is, is rather low. It's fairly constant in the two-phase region. And then it shows a slightly weird behavior in the single-phase beta phase, dropping down at, in, in this manner. This other curve is the pressure, and it shows the characteristic increase in pressure. And we can uh, compare the three measurements uh, this particular one is the, the straight line. The same uh, researcher produced uh, another, did it again with uh, finely divided palladium rather than foil, got essentially the same result. Uh, Flanagan also used foil, but he reported res his points so I could fit them with, with another equation. What we want is the slope. You see, this number here is the total that that would result from adding hydrogen to pure palladium, resulting, let's say, in this composition. I would like to know what energy would result in going from here to here. In other words, the slope of this curve. And it's very interesting to note that that slope is negative. In other words, if this is a straight line, it means that once you enter that region of composition, the reaction with hydrogen is endothermic. It is not exothermic. In other words, energy is required to put hydrogen into the lattice. In other words, there's anti-bonding. There's the rejection of the hydrogen taking place. If it's a straight line, then it's a fixed number. In the case uh, here, this can be fit by a quadratic. The slope goes from about a point uh, six uh, kilojoules per mole uh, plus, that this is exothermic, to 103 minus at the other composition. Anyway, so this is the literature, and, and these, these samples are in equilibrium, and so, um, and, and they all agree very nicely. So the question is, how does that fit with what I see? This is the same measurement of these three different materials, uh, each one loaded. Uh, and measurements made as a function of, of uh, atomic ratio. And this, these are the data points shown in the previous slide. So you see that my data really is rather close to what's in the literature. However, the behavior of the alpha phase is quite different. I'm seeing a very large uh, enthalpy of formation, whereas they saw a very small one. Well, what could be the cause of that, uh, other than just simply sloppy measurement and error? Let's do the same thing they did. Let's load and deload repeatedly. Now, when the, we know that when that happens, weird things happen to palladium. The volume expands, the shapes change, the basic characteristics change, and that's one of the problems that we have in this field, that if you load and look at, and then deload and reload again, you're not looking at the same sample. You're not looking at the same 
characteristics. You're not looking at the same properties. And so it's very difficult to reproduce a measurement because the sample nature keeps changing. And you can see the way it, it change, keeps changing. The enthalpy of formation of the alpha phase steadily drops as that process is imposed. The beta phase, not so much. So let's, uh, go. let's look at the slope. Let's look at the, essentially the bond energy that this represents. The original one was fairly high for the alpha phase. The beta phase is not affected very much. Uh, but when you do many of these loadings and deloadings, this is after six of them, the enthalpy of formation of the alpha phase re is reduced to that value which was measured by the other studies. So in other words, I can re reproduce what, what's that? Four minutes? I can reproduce what they saw uh, simply by loading and deloading. I can do that same thing by rolling. In other words, if I load and then make this measurement, deload, and then roll the sample so that it uh, is half the thickness, nothing else has changed, I get this characteristic. So the distortion of the bonds that results from deloading, from rolling rather, and from deloading is similar. And you can see here the difference between uh, the original sample and the rolled sample all manifests itself in the alpha phase. The beta phase is hardly affected at all. The important thing about the beta phase, however, is that it is exothermic initially and then drops like the other data in the literature shows, but that shows more detail. Uh, the scatter here is because I make that measurement every minute. Every time I take uh, a, a measurement, I, I get another independent value. So there's a random scatter. But you can see the trend. And the trend shows that at some critical composition, the bonding becomes exothermic, or becomes endothermic, rather. It, it, it requires energy. <clears throat> well, it's rather interesting that you can see a, 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 another characteristic that has a relationship. This is the resistivity. And as you can see, the resistivity increases as you add hydrogen to the beta phase until a critical composition is reached, and then it starts dropping very rapidly. That composition corresponds very closely to where the bonding becomes endothermic. The explanation that I can offer is that the the bonding in this region, which is exothermic, results from the electron that goes with the hydrogen <clears throat> going into the 5s level of the palladium, producing a bond, an attractive bond. But at this point, that, uh, those states become saturated, and now the electron goes into the conduction band where it is non-bonding. And that non-bonding characteristic shows up as a negative energy. That is, it requires energy to put it into that state. Now, all of this is very, very important to theory and understanding of L, E, and R. But unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that. It would take another hour or two, and no, no doubt bore most of you to death. But uh, recognize that this does have a direct bearing on theory and theoreticians need to take this into account. So let's summarize very quickly. The addition of hydrogen to beta palladium hydride above about 0.75 produces increased non-bonding between the palladium and the hydrogen as added electrons enter the conduction band rather than bonding orbits. The measurement of the recombiner temperature allows the ratio and the bond energy to be determined. And it's a trivial measurement. I mean, I, I didn't hit upon this until fairly recently, and I keep kidding, kicking myself because this is, this is so easy now. The loading behavior shows important information about the loading mechanism, and so it's really worth following this uh, loading in detail. 
And the bond energy uh, gives information about the mechanism and how it might function. The stability of the alpha phase is very sensitive to purity and treatment, but the beta phase not so much. Now the role of the alpha phase in, in LENR is still somewhat uh, ambiguous. Thank you very much. I can take uh, one or two questions over there. So, um, I, I enjoyed your talk a lot, and I'm a fan. Um, in the 1930s and 1940s, people measured resistance of alloys. And if you go from a pure to a mix to a pure the other one, uh, as a general trend, the resistance goes up and comes down. And in those days, the resistance curve for alloys was uh, interpreted in terms of order. Uh, you're not interpreting the uh, alloy for hydrogen palladium in terms of uh, any order effects here. That's true. I'm not. I'm, I'm relying on what I might call conventional chemistry in terms of the way in which the electrons are interacting. Now, order will certainly play a role in resistivity. I, I'm not denying that. But in this particular case, I think we can explain it without having to impose that particular aspect. Dr. Storms, I thought you were going to talk about loading and deloading, and I made this visual aid for you. <laughs> wow. All right. Looky here. See, if you give a talk about loading, this is what you get as a reward. That's the best reward. <laughs> and this is, will be a lot more comfortable to wear than what I'm wearing now. Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> Do you have a, an estimate for the rate of desorption? Yes, uh, I can measure that, and it, it is characteristic of the material. Uh, it, it has a rate over a range. Some samples don't deload at all. It's rather amazing. For example, the single crystal material. You load it up to 0.8, take it out, and it just simply sits there. It does not deload at all. Other samples will deload fairly rapidly, and if you leave them out very long, they'll almost go back, well, they'll go, go back to about 0.6 and then stay there. But the lo deloading characteristic is really very, very important because that deloading is occurring during electrolysis as well. It, I mean, it, it, and, and that aspect of deloading, you can't do anything about by altering the surface characteristics. So you want to try to avoid whatever mechanism is causing deloading normally out in the air. And that deloading is unaffected, by the way, whether it's an acetone or whether it's an electrolytic cell. It has the same characteristics and the same rates, so long as the, so long as the electrolysis is not on, uh, taking place. Well, I'm sorry. Relative time scale, no, uh, two minutes, minutes, seconds, well, hours, days? Um, well, it's very, uh, let's see, the slope is such that it will deload, let's say if it's at 0.8 to start with, in, uh, in seven minutes, which is what the time I use, it'll go down to maybe about 0.75. It doesn't change a lot, but if you use a five-place balance, you can measure it to three significant figures and get a very good number. Since the time, time is over, um, I just take a one short question. Um, Ed, thank you for that presentation. Um, do you think the change of slope in the enthalpy of formation of the palladium hydride is related to occupancy of the tetrahedral sites within the metal lattice? No. Um, I mean, tetrahedral sites can be occupied, and they certainly are occupied temporarily during diffusion whether they're there uh, as a steady uh, occupation, that would change the composition effectively because um, there would be places where it could go other than where it, you expect it to go. And, and if you have that kind of occupancy, you would expect it to increase as you get closer and closer to the saturation limit, in which case the H to PD ratio should exceed one. I have never seen it exceed one. Also, people use neutron diffraction and, and using deuterium. 
can see it. And, and there's some evidence that there might be some minor occupancy, but I don't think it's a major characteristic of the material. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.